Hi, I'm Kevin Magnussen, and you're listening to Beyond the Grid. Hi everyone, Tom Clarkson here, and welcome to your favourite podcast. It's Beyond the Grid, presented by Bose QuietComfort 35-2 wireless headphones. My guest this week is one of Formula One's hard men. He takes no prisoners on track, and he says exactly what he thinks off it. Remember his suck my balls put down of Nicker Hulkenberg a couple of years ago? Yeah, I'm talking, of course, about Kevin Magnussen. Kevin is now in his fifth full season of F1 and is third with the Haas team. His performances continue their upward trajectory and last year he had 11 points finishes en route to ninth in the World Championship. And his qualifying performances this season have been excellent as well, even if the Haas VF19 has proved a little inconsistent at times. F1 is very much the family business for the Magnussons. Kevin's father, Jan, raced for McLaren and Stewart in the 90s, but Kevin has been the more successful of the two. He has 90 starts under his belt already and more than 150 World Championship points to his name. Kevin is F1's Great Dane. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Kevin, welcome to the show. Lovely to have you on Beyond the Grid. Well, it's been only a few days since the French Grand Prix. Difficult one for the team. Just wondering what you've been up to since then. We uh, stayed in France, me and my girlfriend. So uh, came here yesterday, um, had a few days to relax in, in the south of France, which was good. Here being Austria, because of course we've got these back-to-back -back course, Grand Prix. Yes. So you haven't been back to Roskill, because I was... I was, I was Googling Roskill and I see it's almost time for the Roskill Music Festival. Yes, so that's the time you want to stay away from there. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, because we kind of like double the, the people there by 10 or something on, on this week. So it's not a, not a great place to be unless you're in the festival. Have you been? Yeah, many times. You know, growing up, my parents always went there and it's kind of, a, yeah, I've been probably 10 or 15 times. What kind of bands do they get going to that? They've I mean, had big ones. I mean, um, recently, a few years ago, Metallica came there. And, you know, these new ones, Rihanna and uh, I think uh, Drake. Uh, yeah, so they've good had fun. many. Say again? Good fun. Yeah, good fun. Good fun. How do you relax? You say that you spend a bit of time with your girlfriend and stuff, but after a race weekend, how long does it take you to wind down and... As I say, just relax and sort of start kicking on to the next race. I think it depends a lot on uh, what kind of weekend you've had. Last weekend in France wasn't wasn't a good weekend, and then it takes you a bit longer to kind of forget about it. And uh, you know, it's it's in your body. The disappointment is is in your body for for a, a while. But then it's good, you know, on those on those types of uh, weekends, it's good to to go away and do something. Uh, um, positive and, and uh, fun because you know especially on, on a back-to-back -back weekend because uh, you don't have a lot of time to build up again and get ready you know you, you say how you're, you 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 takes a while to get over the disappointment of a weekend like like France um, in your mind are you sort of going through what you might have been able to do differently if you'd had the weekend again what would you do is, is it that is that what's going through your mind or are you just just point blank annoyed no it, again it depends a lot i find sometimes if i've had a a day where i feel like i've messed up like say in canada i crashed in in q2 um i hit the the wall of champions and um you know when you do something like that and you go to bed in in the evening it runs on like repeat in your head and I find it really difficult to fall asleep because it, it's just like a, a film that runs on repeat in your head and it's really hard to stop it. So it, you really can, you have to put your mind to something different, like call a friend or, or something like watch a movie or, because otherwise it just runs in, in, in your head. I don't know how it is for other drivers, but that's how I have it. When, when I've messed up, that's what happens. But in a weekend like France, where the whole weekend was just poor, then, you know, it, it's just one big disappointment and you just need to get the, the, the depression out of your body and uh, move on. Kev, equally, when you have a good result and a good weekend, are you lying awake at night for different reasons? Because you're just excited and happy and... 
no, then I sleep like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's really funny. Like when when it goes well, everything is just easy, and you know you, you sleep well, and you you already you, you straight away you look forward to the next race, and yeah, when it when it goes well, it's it's all easy. While we're talking about Haas, then, um, what has this team got to do to become a, a big front running team? Do you think to become a big front running team? I think, or maybe not big, but just a front yeah. running team. Well, I, I think it's more. I, I'm really excited about these new regulations for 2021, because I think that's when we, you know, a team like us may have a, a chance of fighting the the big ones because the big ones are going to get smaller effectively, hopefully, if they go through with, with what they're saying on, on cost caps and, and all that. So I think that's really exciting. You know, if, if, if Formula One just would continue as it is right now, then probably we wouldn't have a chance with the way we, we kind of uh, set up as a team. It wouldn't, it wouldn't ever work, I think. So... It's good that we have these new regulations, and I think you know um, that's what probably Günther and Jean has been hoping for and uh, fighting for, probably. yeah, and fighting yeah. for, I guess yeah. as well. So, yeah, it, it will be interesting. I think already we're we're fighting the big boys sometimes. You know, it's not we we uh, we beat a Red Bull in in Monaco and uh, somewhere else as well. I think Bahrain uh, in Bahrain we almost beat both of them. I think we were like a a hundredth of uh, Verstappen and and beat uh, Gasly. So sometimes we can we can take on those uh, big teams, and that's pretty incredible. If you actually, you know, for people outside of, you know, who don't know so much about it, maybe it looks easy. But you know, when we do that, it's kind of like you know we shouldn't do that with with the way we uh, we are as a team, how small we are, and the resource we have. So 2021, there was obviously. 175 mil cost cap. Um, Christ, that's your salary. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in like a Thai, yeah, yeah. In Thai value or something. <laughs> but Kev, imagine you've got a clean sheet of paper. You're quite an old school racer, right? That's what, one of the things I love about you. What would you like from a car? Is it more power, less grip? Um, I think there's different ways of, of looking at it because I think um, if you just went for what, you know, went for the things that would make the car pleasurable to drive then it wouldn't necessarily mean good racing i i like fast cars of course and and you know i think if all drivers would say that they they want cars that are you know really really fast and these cars that we have at the moment are incredibly fast they have so much grip and and they also got a lot of power we got around a thousand horsepower in a in a not very big car so um you know, a thousand horsepower in a Formula One car should be enough, but it kind of isn't enough because we've got so much so much grip. So, you know, throttle application is in in qualifying at least on new tires and low fuel. Throttle application is not really an issue. You kind of just as soon as you got the front pointing somewhere in the right direction, you you just hammer the throttle. So, I'd like it to be more challenging in in that aspect, so that. You know, in, in fast corners, you're still sliding the rears on, on, on exit. How much have the circuits got to answer for? Because you say you're, you're slamming the throttle down in quality. Were you doing that in Monaco? Yeah. Oh, even in Monaco? Because yeah, I was going to say, someone like Paul Ricard, I can understand you doing that. But if, when you've got a barrier there, you're still meshing the throttle. You're still doing it. And it, obviously in Monaco, it just feels a little bit more exciting. You feel that, you feel the walls getting close mm. a little bit. And, and you you feel more on the edge than you do in Paul Ricard where you've just got, you know, massive tarmac areas at either side of the track. So there's no risk at all. Even even in terms of, you know, not only talking about danger, but also in terms of, you know, messing up your lap. If you go off, you just kind of hope that the stewards didn't see it and you come back and, can, you know, finish your lap. Whereas that's not how it works in Monaco. That's not, is it? Well, let's talk. Can we talk family? Um, so you grew up with your mum, Britt, and I just want to know how much of a racing fan was she, you know, did she go karting with you? Is she, was she the person that put you in a kart for the first time or was it your dad, Jan, of course, who raced for McLaren and Stuart? And no, my mum is not a, a racing fan at all, or at least she wasn't when, 
you know, when she met my dad at a very young age, they were like 15 or something, 14. And um, my mom and dad were 17 and 18 when, when I was born, so really young. And my dad was still in, in karting when my mom got pregnant. So, you know, it was all very new to her. And then I was born um, about a year after, obviously, and then I started karting pretty much straight away when I was like two years old or something. So, you know, it, it's for my mom, it's, it's, um, it's obviously been a huge part of her life because she, she had my dad when, when they were together. And then straight away, I, I've, I've started, you know, uh, karting every day. And so she was, she was like thrown into it. And I think she, now she loves it. You know, she, she watches everything and, you know, she knows everything about it and follows everything. But I think she, um, does she feel your pain when you have very a much, bad weekend? Very equally? much. And she feels your joy. Yeah, when you she wants me to succeed. Is she like your number one fan? No, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> she, uh, everything I do is right and I can't ever do anything wrong in her eyes. So, <laughs> you know, if I ever want some, uh, you know, some, some positive view on, on a race weekend, I just call her. But, you know, that's how moms should be. And I think she's been great in uh, just supporting me and letting me do, you know, letting me pursue my dream and um, not kind of, in a way she took a risk, I guess, with, with me because she, she's never pushed me um, in any other direction. You know, I think she saw that, that this was really what I truly wanted to do and, and she felt that I, then I should pursue that and, uh, and not worry about school and, and other things, I think. I've uh, never met a mum who says, don't worry about school. I don't think did she said mom, that, but at least I, that's, what, that's the message I got. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think she said, don't worry about school. She didn't, definitely. But she, um, she didn't kind of worry too much that I didn't go to school because, you know, I was away a lot of the time and okay. I missed a lot of school and didn't always do my homework because I went from directly from school to the go-kart track and came back, you know, in the evening and went straight to bed. So a lot of times I, I didn't do my homework and I missed school and she never really, you know, did anything about that. She didn't try to stop it and she, she supported me to, to uh, push she my She sounds dream. amazingly cool. Which kart track is this then? Is there one in, in near Roskilde? So, no, I, yeah, there is, a, there is one in, in Roskilde, but my, I, um, I was always in, in the one in Copenhagen. There's, a, 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 there's two good ones and the one is in Roskilde and the other one is Copenhagen. But I just went to Copenhagen because they, um, they were open more days a week. So uh, we could train pretty much every day. And how much did you see your dad at this point or was he always away racing? He, he was always away. And um, the first two or three years of my life, he lived in England. And Is that when he was in Formula 3 with Yeah, Jackie in Stewart Formula and, 3 yeah. and then he went to DTM and then Formula 1. And I pretty much didn't see him in the first two or three years. You know, maybe a couple of times a year we, uh, we went to England to, uh, to see to see him but uh, but you know you have to remember he was a formula 3 driver uh, when i was uh, 2 years old so you know he didn't earn any money at all and that we didn't have money for a flight ticket to uh, to go and see him so it was uh, yeah very limited how much i saw him in, in those years but obviously as a 2 year old i don't remember so it's not like i <laughs> i felt felt too bad but then he got to formula 1 and he uh, finally got money so that we could come with him and and uh, yeah, I remember all those uh, times watching uh, from the sideline and in the pit lane. Very you got well. fond memories. I mean, so what did he, he was at McLaren and did a race for them in was it Aida? I think in ninety yeah, five. In ninety five. But then he then went to Stewart, didn't he? A little bit later, he would have been a bit older. Do you, is are those the memories that you? Yeah, I remember. I don't remember any of the stuff with McLaren. I remember going to Spa uh, when he was at Stewart. And watching on the old pit lane down towards the Rouge. Uh, that's my first memory of, of Formula One. And especially the sound, as everyone's saying. You know, at least people that saw Formula One for the first time when it was V10s and V8s. Um, that's a really vivid memory from, from that time. And at what point for you did it become a, 
I want to get to Formula One. What, at what point was it karting is fun and I'm just going to do this because I enjoy it to this could be my career? I don't know. It's just always, always been completely natural for me to, you know, I've always known that this was what I was going to do and in a really naive way and childish way, I guess, because I've never doubted it as a kid. You know, I, I only started kind of realizing how difficult and unrealistic it was when I grew up and reached, uh, you know, adulthood. You know, because all my childhood and all my teenage years, I, I just completely knew that was that it was going to happen. And I never, I also think it was because no one, no one around me kind of questioned it and nobody around me said that it would be hard to do or, you know, uh, even, you know, I think a lot of parents would s tell their kids that uh, it, it's impossible, you know, if they come and say that they want to be Formula One drivers. But I guess my family saw that my dad could do it. And if this guy can do it, then, uh, you know, everyone can do it. <laughs> Maybe that's what they thought. Well, where did this motor racing gene come from? Because like Denmark's not famous for its F1 drivers. Tell me if I'm wrong, but there's you and your dad, Nicholas Chiesa, and I think, is it Tom Belso from back, yeah. in, back in the day in the 70s? You know, there's not a long history with, with F1. Why the passion? Where did it come from? I mean, I suppose for you it was dad, but where did, where did it come from for him? For him, it came from his, uh, his brother as well. They, them, them two together, you know, they... So my, my uncle is older than my dad. He's about eight years older than my dad. And, uh, and he was a motocross rider as a, as a kid and as a teenager, but quickly uh, realized he wasn't going to make it. And then he, he, uh, he pushed my dad into it and, and wanted my dad to be a motocross rider. So they started doing that together and my uncle would take care of the bike and my dad would, would ride it. But I don't think my dad liked it. So they, they stopped that. But my uncle was so you know, he wanted my dad to do something because he liked that kind of relationship where my uncle would take care of the equipment and my dad would, would, uh, would, would drive it. And so when my dad didn't want to do motocross, I think my uncle said, okay, we'll try a go-kart then. And then he did that for a while. And, and I think my dad didn't like it at all when he was, uh, when he began. But, um, so then they stopped for a while and then, uh, had a year off, I think. And then they started again because they went to this like a, a school where they had a, a track as well like a small track so they started again and and i think my dad realized he was uh, pretty good at it and then started liking it because okay i'm good at it so you know i'll continue and then they 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 continued like that and you know it's a it's a long story of course it's it's pretty incredible how they how they got got to the top of carding together with no money at all because uh, my uncle was a was a what do you call it? Working with metals, welding. Uh, Welder, yeah. Yeah, and and um, and didn't earn any money, so they drove to Italy in a in a old Ford Transit with with an old go kart at the back and became world champions and you know incredible stories like that. And um, then my dad got to you know have a manager and got sponsored and stuff like that. So I think the the passion comes from those two guys, them them two together started this this uh, this thing in in motorsport and does your, what's your uncle's name eric and does eric follow your career passionately now very very much yes. does he come to races and not very often no okay. he, uh, he he watches it from home yes we'll get back to kevin in just a moment but first hear this if you're looking to create a professional website or perhaps revamp an old one then listen carefully because we have a special offer for you Beyond the Grid listeners. Wix is the most technologically advanced website building platform available. So I can see why 140 million people currently use it for their own websites. With Wix, you'll get all the tools you need to create the website you want. With great benefits, including unlimited storage, a custom domain, email marketing tools, and premium apps and dedicated support from their team. All sites include built-in SEO tools so that you can help boost the visibility of your website online and be found in search engines like Google and Bing. And if you need a little help on that front, then you can always opt to use Wix's SEO Wiz for a personalized plan. And that's just skimming the surface of what they can offer. 
So see how Wix could help you and get started by going to Wix.com. That's Wix, W-I-X.com forward slash grid to get 10% off. That's Wix.com forward slash grid to get 10% off. Now let's get back to Mr. Magnuson. So given that you're the only Danish F1 driver, can you just give me an idea of how famous you are at home? It's hard to I mean, is it huge? Is it huge? I mean, don't be modest. Do you get mobbed every time you go home? I don't don't know. I mean, it's not like I get mobbed. It's, um, I think in, in Denmark, pretty much everyone knows that there is a Danish Formula One driver called Kevin. But I don't know what they, how they feel about that. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, I feel like, yeah, when I walk around in, in Roskilde, a lot of people look at me and... Uh, You're not paying for dinner, are you, when you go to Roskilde? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure I am. For oh, sure yeah, I am. Okay. It's not the, no, I haven't reached that kind of level yet. <laughs> but um, no, it's it's okay. I mean, I don't think about it too much. Yeah. It's um, And Kevin, yeah. what else were you good at? Growing up, I mean, like handball's massive at home, badminton's massive. Any of that? Football? No, it was all. It was all karting. It was all karting. Yeah, yeah it, everything with the engines on, and uh, yeah, I was, I was very focused on that, and it was all my whole my whole world evolved around karting and motorsport. Uh, so it, it, I never paid any attention to anything else. It was pretty, you know. I wouldn't want my kid to be like that because it's, uh, you <laughs> it's know, an all it's, or nothing yeah, existence. Yeah, very much. Yeah. If, I had, if I hadn't gone anywhere with, with motorsport, if I hadn't become What would you be doing? I have no idea. It would have been pretty difficult for me to, uh, to take another direction and to learn other things, I guess, because uh, I, hadn't, I didn't pay any attention to school. And obviously I learned to read and, and, and the basics. But um, Your English is pretty darn good. That's only because I traveled a lot and, you know, been with, with the foreign teams and that's, that's why, how I learned English. And I, I, I don't know what I would have done if, if I hadn't um, made it as a racing driver. Don't all mechanics try and teach drivers to swear in that particular language, right? So that's you did true, a lot yeah. of racing in Italy, so I imagine you're pretty comprehensive on swear, <laughs> Italian yes. swear words yes. and English. Are you good at... <laughs> yeah, ev- everywhere I've been with German teams, <laughs> French teams, Italian... Uh, American, so yeah. a, a lot of uh, a lot of swear words. That's for sure. <laughs> and so you say, Dad was busy racing. Of course he was. Um, but he must have come and seen some of your karting. What kind of a karting dad was he? I would say he was not a very good karting dad. He got involved too much and uh, was too kind of um, too much of a of a teacher and. I guess he just wanted me, you know, to succeed. He didn't, uh, obviously he didn't mean it in a bad way, but it didn't work. You know, it didn't, I didn't need my dad to, uh, to tell me anything because there's just some kind of, uh, you wanted to dis- discover it for yourself. Yeah, I guess so. And, uh, and, and I guess as a, as a, as a kid and especially as a teenager, you just don't want to listen to your parents no matter what, you know, even if they're right. And I think the problem was that he was right in most of the things he said. So it was even more annoying. So I think, yeah. And if you're listening, (laughs) (laughs) but I I think he realized that I felt like that and, and that it didn't work. And then he, he stayed, he just, I think he took a decision and, and just stayed away. Not, he didn't stay away, but stayed out of it. And, and didn't try and uh, and get involved, so he just came as as support. And um, ever since I uh, stopped carding, he he's come to races, but just never got involved. And and I think that's a really good thing because everywhere I've been as a junior driver in the lower categories, you've had these dads that try and set up the car and almost try and drive the car for the kids, and you know always. Uh, find excuses and put wrong things in in the in in the heads uh, of their kids and and I think it, it's been really good to to have a dad that didn't didn't do that and so that I could you know create my own uh, views and make my own experience in uh, in motorsport. So he's not offering advice now. Does he come to many races? He comes to a few, not many. Obviously, he's still very busy with his own program. He's a professional racing driver drives with COVID in, in America. So he's, he's pretty busy himself and, and doesn't have a lot of time to, uh, to come to races. I remember 
Kev, where was it? Was it Malaysia 2014? I think he came to Malaysia. You're I think so, yeah. you. He was so proud. <laughs> He yeah. just had a, this smile on his face all weekend that was just wonderful to see. He was so, and of course, I think we that was at the beginning of the season. We just come off the back of that podium in Melbourne, and it was all. Yeah, was no, all I think it was lovely family moment. It was very cool for him, I think, to um, to relive it all again through me because it was uh, it was very similar to how he got there. You know, a lot of uh, memories for him, especially as it was all with McLaren as well. You know, he got through all these junior, junior stuff with, with as a young driver for McLaren and, and got to Formula One and did his first race in Formula One with, with McLaren. And um, for me to do exactly the same, get to Formula One with McLaren and, and the first race there with them and all that, to live it all through again was pretty cool for him, I think. And, uh, History repeating itself, yeah. wasn't it? How, how did the opportunity with McLaren come about? I th- it, the 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 whole thing with McLaren came about because my dad had, had raced there, and uh, I remember, s- you know, Whip- Martin Whitmarsh saying stuff like, you know, that they had unfinished business with with Magnussons and stuff like that. So it all came about because I was his son, and uh, and they wanted to kind of uh, try and make up for. It. I think they felt like they, maybe they felt like they handled it wrong, or they they could have handled it better. With with that with my, with my dad, because mm. uh, I think you could argue they might say the same about you as well. Maybe, but we'll come maybe, on to yeah. that. Yeah, maybe yes, that's, that's that's true. But I think they, that's that's the reason I, you know, could open a door there and and got in in the first place. Um, but then it was also pretty difficult because of all these, you know, they had a lot of, um, you know, that all, all the things that my dad did wrong. They were like looking at me and, and really, so I, I got a little bit more attention because they wanted to see if I was going to make the same mistakes and, and make the same, you know, do the same things as him. So I think it was uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of pressure and a lot of expectations, uh, you know, from the beginning. But, but you delivered right from the beginning, didn't you? I remember that Abu Dhabi test in November 2012, was it? Yeah. You were fastest... And I remember Sam Michael, what was he, technical director yes. or sporting director? Sporting time, director. Sporting director. Um, heaping a load of praise on you after that. Yeah, it was, that test was a bit of a, a breakthrough, I think, because um, I got that young driver test and I was, you know, I was really excited about that. You know, to, that was already a, like a, a dream come true to, to drive a current Formula One car, McLaren as well, the team that I, that I dreamt of racing for my whole my whole life and watching my dad race for and all that so it was really exciting for me to get that test and I'd been part of the the McLaren young driver program for for a few years and you know there was many drivers as young drivers and we all wanted to be the one young driver to get that test and then I was the one and I was so excited about it and and I got there and we um I remember the night before I couldn't sleep at all so I was awake at six in the morning and we had to what, just leave. excited yeah I could, I just could not sleep. And we had to leave the hotel at eight to be at the track for, or maybe we had to leave the hotel at seven to be at the track for, for eight o'clock or something like that. And at six in the morning, I was still awake and just panicking because I, <laughs> I was, you know, I was going to test the next day. So I didn't have any sleep at all. So, but then I, I got there and I didn't feel tired at all. Just went, went in the car and was so pumped to, uh, to go. And, and I remember it just felt so natural. You know, I started pushing from the first lap, you know, exiting the pit lane. I just kind of, I felt at home immediately. And then, you know, just pushed as hard as I could from the first run. Didn't need any uh, laps to to get used to it. And I think McLaren were impressed with how quickly I I got up to speed with it. It wasn't the ultimate speed at the end. It was the, the my fastest lap time was a good time, but it was how quickly I uh, I got up to speed. I think that that kind of uh, surprised them and 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 uh, impressed them do you think that was the test that laid the foundations for 2014 you getting the race drive in 2014 yeah i think very much and also um also the, the year after i think from that test they they looked at me and you know and thought he's a good one and then they were pretty serious about it and, and gave me a, a test driver contract and moved me up a level uh, in the in the program, and then 
for the following year, 2013, I was kind of their, their lead young driver. And, and they told me that to get to Formula One, I had to win the World, World Series by Renault Championship. So th there's no, but if you no come pressure. second, it's not going to happen. You know, it's, you have to win this. And I think also because I hadn't, I'd finished second in, in all my championships. For some reason, I, miss, I missed out on quite a few championships in Formula Renault and in Formula 3, British Formula 3, I finished second. And uh, it wasn't because of, of a lack of speed, it was more just a lack of, uh, of consistency. I, I needed to show that I could be a consistent championship contender and, and finish it off and win the championship. So that was the criteria. You have to win, otherwise forget it. And then I won the championship. And obviously they then uh, gave me the, the seat for the, for the following year. Can you remember the phone call? Did it come very soon after winning the title? The phone call to say that you were going to be a race driver? Uh, no, it didn't come soon after. It, it, was a, it was a bit of a process. I thought I was going to go to uh, Force India, actually. And um, I didn't have a contract, but I had a, you know, a firm handshake that I was going to race for Force India and McLaren were going to supply them with stuff and uh, it was going to be like a, a deal so to, for, for McLaren to put me in Force India for a few years and then take me. But then Ron came in and uh, that was the time when he pushed Whitmarsh out and he came in and, and uh, I think he, he wanted to change a lot of things and, and I was one of the things to, uh, to be changed. So I, I got the seat instead of Perez and, uh, and uh, obviously I was pretty happy with that but then the, the, the following year, Force India ended up with three or four podiums, and we we only had one. So uh, it wouldn't have been a bad bad one to go with Force India, but I was obviously pretty excited. So was Ron the person who who rang you to tell you that you were going to be in? No, he oh. wasn't the one. Uh, he came in, and then he made Whitmarsh tell me uh, that you know it was already Whitmarsh left the team or got got sacked or whatever happened. Um, but it was already, it was in, in the weeks leading up to that, that, uh, that Ron came in and said, you know, he said a lot of things, he changed a lot of things when he came back, but, uh, yeah, w I was one of them and, and Whitmarsh was still there when, when I got the, so, so Martin told me that I, that I'd got the seat and he was so scared of, uh, of, uh, all the, the, the Mexicans, <laughs> Carlos Lim and all that. He was, he was really nervous about it. And I think Martin's plan was a good one. He wanted to, uh. I think he, he, Martin knew me quite well and I had a good, really good relationship with, with Martin. Um, and I think he, he was right that it would have been good for me to get to a smaller Formula 1 team and kind of get used to Formula 1 in, in a smaller team and, and then get to McLaren um, afterwards. And I think it would have been better for me and better for them because for me, obviously, would have been better to have a quiet time and, and get used to things and for them it would have also been you know a, a, a good one to kind of be able to see how I evolved and, and developed in, in a smaller team so they didn't have to take the chance but uh, but I'll bet you weren't thinking that on the Sunday night of Melbourne no not at all <laughs> you just finished what third on the road and then you inherited Daniel Ricciardo's second place when he was excluded weren't you? I mean what an amazing debut yeah. I guess you slept well that night yes <laughs> yes I slept very well no, it was it was just incredible, you know that that day or that weekend because I also qualified really well. The, the qualifying was was wet in in Australia, and um, anyone who's raced in in Australia in the wet knows that it's a tricky place to to drive in the wet. And I qualified fourth, and um, and then obviously finished third on the road and got promoted to second. So it was just a crazy weekend all all the way through. Um, you know, already your first weekend in Formula One, your first race weekend in Formula One is incredible. Even if you get to the podium or not, it's incredible. Just getting on the track um, in a live Formula One session, driving out the pits with all the other Ferraris and, you know, what Mercedes and all these other, you know, Formula One cars. It, it was such a real moment. And was it surreal real? at the same Does time. it feel a bit surreal? Does it feel it, like yeah. it's... It's it's suddenly so real that it's it, it becomes surreal. Like, you know, I guess it, it's like a, it's like it, it's a bit of a feeling like this can't be true. You know, this, is, yeah. is this really me on this uh, track in this McLaren and on the track with Ferraris and Mercedeses and Red Bulls and yeah, it, it's very very cool already. And then to finish on the on the podium was just uh, like, you know almost too much. What did Ron say to you? What did Ron? He after the race he. Um, 
he said that he would uh, he said something like he would bolt my shoes to the to the floor I guess not to like uh, get big big headed or like lose my keep my feet on on the ground but uh, he didn't need, need to do that because the rest of the season was pretty shit so uh, I, I, my feet were firmly on the floor <laughs> Kevin amazing first race but I suppose in hindsight was it almost too much too soon is there an element of that yeah I think so I mean um, you know obviously after a debut like that your expectations are then next race I'm gonna win you know I finished third or well, second in the first race and so you know it's got to be a, it's got to be a win next and it really wasn't it was very difficult after that because Australia was a one-off for us you know for McLaren we didn't really have the car to uh, to be fighting for podiums we had a decent car but it was more like a good top 10 car just Mercedes and and Red Bull were just way quicker than us and often Force India as well so it was tough and I think it, it, that that first race getting on the podium made the rest of the season tougher because I felt I felt disappointed no matter what you know if I qualified fourth it would it wouldn't be any special you know and I and I, I did qualify fourth again in in Australia in uh, Germany and I remember not feeling excited about that and and you know afterwards well, been now, there done that I've done this before yeah exactly it was yeah. kind of like and I think if I had qualified fourth for the first time in Germany I would have had a very different mindset I would have seen that as a big opportunity and and kind of um probably handled it differently and um instead I was always too aggressive and wanted expecting too much and and um and and therefore I didn't get the best out of it because I I I had been on the podium and top five wasn't in my mind you know nowadays top five is would be brilliant so my expectations have, have changed but back then I couldn't make the best of a of a of a top you know a, a Q3 wasn't anything so if I qualified eighth I couldn't make the best of it because I wanted to I wanted to win I wanted to uh, at least get on the podium you know that I did that first race so yeah it's 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 actually been a bit of a a challenge to overcome that and change those expectations after that. How was Jensen? Because his sort of public persona is, is a very laid back, funny guy. Is he like that on the inside when you're battling with him as a teammate? Jensen is um, a very nice guy and, and very funny and, you know, just a charismatic guy. Uh, you know, I guess you all, all know that. But he's also a, a fierce competitor. And he's very intelligent, so he's he's really not a, a a very easy driver to have as as your teammate because he he especially me being in my first year he could outsmart me a lot of the time. I felt like I was faster than him, you know. I I, I was never I I didn't feel like I I couldn't match him uh, driving wise, but he would just always be on the right strategy and always be on the right setup and always test the right things in practice and end up with a better car and he would just outsmart me the whole time, every time. So uh, I think... I guess I, that's experience for you, though. It is, it? but he used that experience very mm. well. You know, you see some drivers that uh, that have experience and, and they don't make the best of it. And, and um, you know, I learned a lot from Jensen. And, and after the first few races, I started just copying him and, and looking at him a lot more because I think I came in still being naive and arrogant in, in my head. So I didn't, I, I felt like I had him under control. So, you know, I don't need to look at him, but very quickly I learned that probably it's a good idea to to watch him and, and you know, try and, and learn as much as I could from him. So how did you feel at the end of that season when Alonso comes in, you're pushed back to third reserve driver? Can you describe the frustration? Oh, it was just... Um, it was it, it was a real shock for me because um, Eric Poulier and the rest of the management there had, had made me feel so secure about my situation. I knew halfway through, about around around Spa, I knew that uh, they'd signed Alonso, and that was way before it got announced. So uh, we we knew both me and Jensen that uh, that they'd signed Alonso, and that one of us would would go. And I think um, then we started 
fighting really hard, me and Jensen, and the pressure got really high because obviously knowing that one of us is going to go, that's, that's a tough situation. But um, it ended up so that I could feel that Jensen wanted to retire. And also because I think the team were actually excited about me and, and felt I, I felt a lot of support within the team from the whole of the engineering and the, the you know the, the the guys in the team and but also from the management so you know uh, by the end of it I, I had no doubt in my mind that uh, that I was gonna continue and Jensen even had like a farewell helmet uh, ready for his last race and had pictures in his driver room with memories from his career and he, he really he thought that he was going to go and I thought that I was going to stay so we didn't even talk to any other teams or had any plan b because we were like nah we don't we don't need that and and uh, and uh, you know we, we're gonna stay so wowzers gosh so that's that, when did you get the bad news then so like a day a day or two days before that the the driver presentation so and up until that point, I, I didn't have any doubt, you know. And that, but they had a meeting. I started getting nervous because, you know, we were obviously we needed like um, some contractual stuff, uh, legal stuff to go through some paperwork, and it, it it didn't go through after that first meeting where they were gonna just like um, they were gonna have a, vo a vote, and um, obviously I knew the people in on the board, so and and I knew who would vote for me and who wouldn't, and. You know, I thought everyone would vote for me because that's that's what I was told. So, uh, but it ended up so that nine people voted, seven voted for me, and two voted for for Jensen, and the two were the two um, owners. So there were so three that, owners, Ron and and the two others, Mansur and the Baranis, and uh, Mansur and Baranis voted for Jensen, and that was enough. So that two against one in the in the ownership that, so they decided and what an I extraordinary story yeah i don't know why that why they did it really i think they 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 were fighting a lot in between run and 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 Mansur and, and the brainies Mansur and the brainies were fighting run a lot and i think that's how it ended up in in a bit of a you were almost a the pawn in the middle of this yeah. fight and i think they just yeah. wanted to, to to screw run over and whatever run wanted they were going to go against that um, but also Jensen, again, he was very close to those people, uh, both Mansur and, and the Baranis, and I think he did a good job to get in with the right people. But uh, He played a good hand. He did, and he did what he had to, and, and you know, um, again, uh, lesson, lesson learned, I guess. Don't worry, plenty more to come from Kevin in just a minute. But lucky for you, we have another special offer, courtesy of the shaving brand Harry's. Harry's have a special offer for Beyond the Grid listeners, which offers a trial set for £3.95. All you have to do is go to harrys.com forward slash F1 podcast. If you're a regular listener, then you'll know that I've got one of these Harry's shaving kits, and they're definitely worth checking out if you want to switch up your grooming regime. And it's so simple to arrange. Just enter your details online, and you'll get a neat little package delivered to your door with all you need to get going, which includes... A weighted ergonomic handle ensuring maximum comfort and grip while you shave. And there are five precision engineered blades with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade. Harry's also throw in a foaming shave gel, which is fantastic on your skin. And there's a handy little travel blade cover to protect your kit, which just slots straight on. So it's perfect if you're planning to jet off on your holidays over the summer. All of that for just £3.95. High quality blades for half the price of other brands out there. So get started shaving with Harry's today by claiming your trial set for just £3.95. And support our podcast and get your trial set delivered to you. And it includes, once more, a razor handle, five blade cartridge, foaming shave gel and a travel blade cover. So just go to harrys.com forward slash F1 podcast right now. That's harrys.com forward slash F1 podcast. Right. Let's get back to Kevin. So 2015 difficult year I remember just a very frustrated Kevin Magnussen at most of the races and you even were down to even race the car in Melbourne weren't you because Alonso had had that testing accident and I don't even think you, you didn't even make the start did you no I didn't make the grid you know I, I, um, the engine blew up I'm laughing because if I wasn't laughing I'd be crying <laughs> you know, yeah yeah no I mean 
it wouldn't have been a, a great race anyway, um, but it was uh, just like, uh, yeah, depressing. I, can you learn anything from a year like that? Yeah, you can. You learn a lot. Uh, at the time, it, it didn't feel like there was going to be any positives out of, out of that. But um, I mean, Did you learn anything from watching Alonso? I wouldn't say no. I wouldn't say so because I, I was so depressed and frustrated that I didn't even try to make the best of it. You know, I just hated every minute of it and uh, I felt like not being in the paddock. And, uh, you know, I wanted to race. Um, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm just a racer and, I, and I, I've, I've been racing since I was two years old. So my whole life and, and I've never had a time not, not racing. So to so suddenly not be racing and not have any, any next race to look forward to and not be in that rhythm and that lifestyle. And it was really strange and uh, I felt so out of place. And so I wanted to race something, you know, I couldn't race in F1, so at least I want to race something else, but um, McLaren wouldn't let me. And they, they um, you know, I had some opportunities but because the McLaren and Honda, I could have been in, in Japan uh, in Super Formula or in Super GT, uh, just to keep me going and keep me entertained and uh, I guess uh, well, keep me McLaren hungry. McLaren stopped that. They didn't stop it, but they didn't make it happen. And obviously, I, you know, I, I needed their support because with mm. Honda and all that, I think Honda won it. They were supportive. Mm. Um, but didn't you go to Le Mans that year with a camper van? I think you told me you went yeah. to Le Mans with a camper yeah, van. Yeah, with my, I, I <laughs> went had a week with, with my, my, my mates from Raskilde. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> went and complete as a spectator, not, not even like a VIP. Uh, where did you park the van? Can you remember where you watch? In, in some camp, uh, I don't know. I can't remember where it was. Uh, it was in a, in a camp with a lot of other fans and, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was funny. I had to wear some str funny hats and stuff not to, uh, to get mobbed too much at the, because if you go to Le Mans as a spectator, as a Formula One driver, ex Formula One driver, at least it, you know, I, I, I hadn't thought it through. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. Was dad, I suppose dad was racing, was he? Yeah, he was. Yeah. How much would you like to do Le Mans with your father? Yeah, it's one of the it's 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 something I'd really love to do, and uh, and one of those things that we talk about all the time. Obviously, being racing drivers both and uh, still professional racing drivers, it, it it's such a great opportunity, and and we we want to try and do it, but also I want to do it in in a, in the right way, and you know, uh, it, it also has. So do you want to win it, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> I want to I want to win it, and and we can we can win at least the. GT class with um, the Corvette. With Corvette, so mm. it would be a pretty cool. Uh, do you ever have thing that conversation? Do? Yeah, who's faster? No, not really. I think I don't know. I think my dad thinks that I'm faster than him, but we haven't properly tried yet. We had one. Um, my dad ha had. He doesn't have, any, have it anymore. But he had a race team in Denmark that raced in like some Danish touring car, Thunder, Thunder Sport Championship with um, some NASCAR type cars, but on, on road courses. And he had, a, he had his own car and then he had a, another car for, for his teammate. And, um, and they had a race in Denmark the, the following weekend. So we, he asked me if I wanted to come with him uh, to a track in, in Sweden to get the cars ready to, for, with the, and, and bed in brakes. So it was two cars and him in, in one and, and me in the other. And then we, uh, we went on track and started bedding in the brakes, but then we ended up at the same place on track and, and he started pushing and then I went after him. And um, we were doing like 10 or 15 laps in, in the cars, chasing each other and swapping positions and stuff. And uh, we came in and I had the faster lap time. In, in his own car, so he, he took that really badly. And then we, that's the only time we've, we've had any fair comparison and obviously I was a tenth better than him and, uh, and he really didn't like it. We, didn't, we drove together in the same car to the, to the track in Sweden and driving back to Roskilde in the evening. He didn't say a word, you know, he was, he was destroyed. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and after that I think... Um, He's, he's, he's been a bit, uh, I think he thinks that I'm faster than him, but that's fair enough. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy to, to beat him in, uh, in, in a COVID. I think that would be pretty he difficult. He knows that car so well, doesn't yeah. he? But 
let's start talking about um, the sort of Haas situation because you, you came into contact with the team, I think, for 2016, didn't you? How close did you get before they then went for Esteban Gutierrez? Um, I don't think it was between me and Esteban. I think it was more between me and Roman um, for that first year. And they went with, with Roman. You know, I tried to get in and, I, you know, I, I, I was very keen to, to get in. Um, luckily, it, you know, the opportunity with Renault came about, but, um, but they went with, with Roman and I think they, they wanted an experienced guy and, you know, I could, I could kind of understand the, the, the decision of a brand new team and they wanted a lead driver with, with a, a lot of experience to, to help them get started. So, you know. But you got, I mean, did you go over to Charlotte to, to, to meet Jean, Haas and, and Gunter? No, we, we met at, at the races. I remember we met at, in, in Monza. I went to, to, to their truck and, and spoke to Jean and, and Gunter. And, um, I remember Rubens Barrichello had a meeting with them in Monza. About what? This drive. Okay. The 2016 drive. Yeah. Rubens aged. Wow. Goodness knows what he <laughs> was with 326 <laughs> races yeah, okay. under his Well, belt. I bet there, there must have been a lot of drivers uh, yeah. talking to them. Um, but anyway, they went with, with Roman. And as I said, I, I kind of understand that, but I was, I was disappointed. But then the, the opportunity came with, with Renault and I took that. It was um, a tough year with an underdeveloped car and a team that had run out of money and been yeah. with no money for a long time. There'd been so, no investment at all yeah, for years. The, the that, development yeah. had just stopped for, for a long time actually. And um, and it wasn't it wasn't a good car for the following year. But you were back on the grid and there were positives to yeah. take from that and Yeah, at least it made me it gave me a bit more experience and also it gave me the opportunity to, to go to Haas the following year. Sure. Um do you think if you hadn't been racing in 16, you wouldn't have got to Haas in 17? Yeah, two years out, it would have probably mm. been difficult for, mm. for Gunther and Jean to go for me. But um, Any positives to take out of that Renault year that we can... Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, the whole opportunity to yeah. go to Haas, I think... That is the main positive. That's, that's the main yeah. positive. And it, it kick-started, or it kick-started, at least it got my Formula 1 career going again. And um, those circumstances... Uh, you know the the st circumstances around me getting that Renault drive was pretty spectacular. Also, with everything that happened uh, with Renault buying Lotus and buying the team and and taking over that that story in itself is pretty crazy. And then the whole thing with with uh, Maldonado in Venezuela and his sponsors and all that. So when did you get the such, nod? What I don't even remember. I think I got the nod like three or four times but I also had like so I got a nod and then it was off and then it got back and you know it was so but it was late January wasn't yeah, it yeah it was very late it, horrible it, winter for you I guess I think the first time mm. I got the nod was like October in the season you know yeah. a half a year before and then it was off and then it came back again and, and it was really like back and forth and and then Renault wasn't gonna buy the team and okay then then now they're, they're back again and buying it again and um drivers in and out and it was very messy and complicated but mm. I ended up getting it so it was all good. So then for 17 did, were you sort of in contact with Haas all the way through 16 talking about the I wouldn't following say all year. the way but um, I can't remember where it was at some race towards the end of the season uh, not just after the middle I think it was actually Brazil or something Malaysia um, Gunther texted me and said what what are, what are you going to do for next year? And that was the first kind of um, thing I heard heard from him. That's quite, a been, nice, quite a nice text to get. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I, you know, immediately I thought, yes, you know, let's mm. let's go for that. Um, I had an opportunity to go with with Renault again, um, but it was not. I felt like they were already. I felt I felt like they needed me for one one year and then to go for someone else or something. They weren't completely committed to me and. You know, I didn't didn't really like like that feeling, so I wanted to to look for other things, and and I was really happy when uh, when Gunter got in touch. Tell me about Gunter. Um, is he scary as a boss? Scary? No, yeah. no. <laughs> is he a scary boss? No, not at all. I you mean, know. that radio message um, in Canada when you'd had a you were talking about how difficult the car was and stuff, and there was a sort of yes. Yeah, he, he he's very straightforward, and you know I I like that about him. There's no 
messing about with him. You know, he, he, you know, what you see is what you get and he will tell you what he thinks and then move on. He's not the type of person that, you know, is, is playing in the background and, and, um, he's not a politician. He's, he's a, he's a racer and a, and a fair bloke. You know, he, he has a, uh, he's an emotional guy and he, uh, yeah, he, he, he gets really happy when, when we do well and, and really disappointed when we don't. And that, that's, you know, that's good to see. It's not, he's not here because, uh, of, of, he's not here for the wrong reasons. He's here because he's a racer and wants to do well. Do you think if Gunter came back as a racing driver, he would come back as you? You strike me as quite similar characters. Old school races. No in some ways, yeah. No nonsense. Yeah, I think in, in, in those points, yes, I think we're very similar. But then obviously we come from very different cultures and we're very different, and, uh, but also similar in, in many ways. I think we, you know, he's definitely a hundred times easier to work with than any of the other team buses I've had. You've got something of a reputation as the bad boy of F1, really, haven't you? Really? Still, I mean, it's, do I still have that? What do I, I mean, it seems that you don't care what other people think of you. That's still relevant? At least in Formula One terms. Yeah. Yeah. Racing-wise, I don't care. You know, it's, it's my job and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's sport. So I don't... I'd feel weird if, if everyone was saying I was a nice guy. I'd feel much worse about that than being the bad guy. Do you feel that you've cultivated this bad boy image or not? I don't know. I mean, I don't deserve it because I, I don't have it. You know, I think I have one penalty point at the moment and I'm amongst like the lowest fifth of, of, the, of drivers in, in that points, penalty points ranking. So, you know, I can't be all that bad. But well, it's two things. I think it, it started, didn't it, in 2017's Suck My Balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> when was it? Hulkenberg comes up to you in the, the TV pen after the race to talk yeah. about the incident at turn two. And suck my balls was the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, he, he interrupted an interview and it was um, pretty disrespectful and just I didn't, I didn't think about what I was going to say, but, you know, I just wanted him to bugger off and uh, I, that, that, was, that was what came to mind. So, yeah, I think it was just, uh, he, he asked for it. You know, I have, after this whole thing, in that interview and the, the, that comment, it, it, there's been, I think Nico took it really personally and, um, uh, he still doesn't ever talk to me. And, um, uh, I think he has, he really holds a grudge after that, but really it's like, you know, I respect him a lot as, as a driver and I don't know him as a person. So, uh, you know, it's like, I think a lot of fans and people that follow Formula One think that there is this thing about me and, uh, between me and Nico, but there really isn't, you know, he, He's a driver that I really respect. He's one of the drivers that I really expect, respect on the grid. And, um, and I think it's, uh, it's more like annoying that, that there is this thing with me and him because, yeah, it, it's, it's not real. You know, it's, it was uh, just that one moment where he interrupted my interview and, and it, you know, I, I said that thing, but it was really nothing more than that. Do you treat each other differently on track? What, me and Since him? then, yeah. don't think so. No, I don't treat anyone differently. Obviously, you know who you're racing with, and and some people, you know, you know kind of what characteristics uh, each drivers have. Some drivers are a bit crazy and uh, and more unpredictable, and then you take you take a margin. And other drivers, you know that you can go a little bit more on the limit. And who are and those guys? The ones you can go on the limit? I'm not going to say no, that. Okay. You know, it's uh, yeah. I, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to say who who is who is what okay. because. Uh, <laughs> but Kev, this so this brings me on to so I mean it's a quote I know you've been asked about it before but in the context of what we're talking about, I will give everything. This is you talking. I will give everything. I will die in the car. I won't hold back. I put my life on the line. Absolutely. That that's a quote from you. It's a very powerful quote. I think a lot of people were su surprised to hear you talk like that. Um, I think they were because the headline was Kevin Magnussen, I want to die in the car or something like that. Yeah. You know, it came, it came out in, in a very unfortunate way. I remember that whole thing because people were asking me, do you really want to die in the car? Well, that's not what I said. 
Mm. I said, I, I, I what will give. What do you mean then? By it just says, I will give everything and I'm not worried about anything driving. I just, when I'm in the car, I don't worry about dying. That's more like, that's more what I meant. And, you know, I said, I, I, I will die in the car if it, or something. It, it came out wrong and I said the wrong thing. What I meant was, I will give everything and I'm not worried about dying. That's for sure. Never worried about dying. Have you ever been scared in a racing car? No. And that's, that's really true. I've never been scared. And what, I've had some big day, crashes. Wet day at spa. No, the you're rain's you're hanging in the air. Never scared. And I've had some big crashes and it's not scary. At yeah. Eau Rouge, actually. Do you remember? The yeah, other? in, in yeah. Eau Rouge, in spa. Yeah. I had a big crash. And, and crashing is not scary. It's, it's, it's almost, it's exciting and really disappointing at the same time, you know, because you're obviously disappointed with crashing out of the race. And then on the other hand, it's also a bit cool and exciting. You know, you have, you have this element in, in, in racing and, and I don't think you can deny it. The danger part and the crashing part is, is also exciting and being able to crash into a wall at 250 or 300 kilometers an hour and survive it with not a scratch is pretty cool. But then obviously you've crashed out the race and you mess it. The first thing that comes to mind is just disappointment of not finishing the race and making a mistake and all that. But there's no denying that the crashes look cool as well. And I don't think, I think a lot of people will agree. You're from the Jacques Villeneuve school. I remember Jacques Villeneuve had a monster crash at Eau Rouge in 1999. And the first thing he said when he got back to the paddock it was it was great i've just <laughs> or something like that well, he was just saying how brilliant his crash was yeah. and we were like oh. well that's maybe too um, much so two more things um first of all last year tell me about last year you were ninth in the world championship you had 11 points finishes can you just describe what it's like when to be on a roll where things are working you're getting points the car is as you want it do you feel pretty invincible in those situations? Yeah, I feel, you know, Formula One, it goes up and down and uh, you have good times you have, and you also have bad times. And, and I think last year it was, it was like a good and consistent year and the car was good a lot of the time. But the thing about Formula One is you're only as good as, as your car. You know, if you don't have the car, then you can be as good as, as anyone and, and you're not going to get anywhere. So... You know, I feel like this year I'm, I'm also driving well and I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm still on that same wave as I was last year. And, and, you know, I think also, you know, you gain experience and you become more comfortable in the sport and, you know, you, 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 you feel like I, I, I can feel that I'm using my experience now and, and um, just I feel more comfortable and, and relaxed and I'm able to extract the best out of myself more often than I was maybe a few years ago. And Does just it take really us back to what we were saying about Jensen and, and using that experience? Do you think you're politically better at Formula One now as well? No, I wouldn't say all the, the politics. I mean, I, I, I don't really think about those things. I don't feel like I'm in, in a place in the sport where politics is important. So no, I wouldn't say I've become a better politician. Um, if anything, I care about it less and, you know, I, I've kind of, I've had too much of it and don't want to deal with it. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm a smarter driver now and, you know, I can use my experience better. And, and, you know, as I said with, with Jensen, he always had a better setup and he always found himself in a, in a better strategy and all that. I feel like I'm going towards that, you know, being able to position myself better and not only drive well, but also get myself in the right setup and, and the right strategy and be in the right place at the right time more often. What would mean more to you? Getting podiums with Haas or getting the attention of a top three team and, and getting podiums with them? Well, I think it would come in the same it would it, what's it the would, I suppose uh, where are we going in terms of your journey if in I, the next if few I can, years if I can deliver for, for Haas consistently in, in all however long I'm going to be with, with the team just consistently deliver and, and be an asset for the team then that's all I can do at the moment you know I, I want to 
my dream is still to be a world champion in Formula One. And that's, that's the sole reason that I'm, that I'm in Formula One is to, because I'm on a mission. But I, I've realized that that mission may take longer than I expected it to. And I've kind of found a, found a place where I can, uh, where I feel like I can develop as a driver and, and, and just grow as a driver, but at the same time also show what I can do. You know, I've, I've, this year we're struggling sometimes and, not, and all that, but, you know, also we have some good times qualifying sixth in, in Monaco and, you know, in Australia finishing sixth and you know we've we've had some good times and I'm 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 in a in a car that where I can show what I can do um, but I, to to become world champion I've just got to do that consistently and continue to to perform well and consistently and then hopefully one day either I can do it with Haas or or one of the big teams uh, need need me as a driver and I can do it for them but um, right now I'm very happy where I am. Well, Kevin, keep demonstrating, keep showing what you can do. It's been it's wonderful to watch you. You're a, you're, you're a great asset to Formula One. So thank, thank you very you. much for your time. Great to speak to you. Cheers. Thank you. If there's such a thing as a natural fit in Formula One, Kevin and Haas would appear to be it. His straight-talking approach is mirrored by team principal Gunter Steiner, and Kevin's respect for Gunter is clear throughout our chat. But he gave us some fascinating insights into his life away from Haas as well, growing up in Roskilde or the highs and lows of his time at McLaren. And I loved his insights into his attitude towards racing. He has to be one of the most passionate racers out there. Thanks, Kevin, for your time. It was great to catch up. And thanks to, to Haas for the hospitality. Well, that's it for this episode, but we'll be back next week with another big name from the world of F1. Until then, why not subscribe to Beyond the Grid if you haven't already? We're on all of your favorite podcast apps, including Apple and Spotify. And thanks for your feedback about last week's episode with Patrick Tombay. He was fantastic, wasn't he? So brave. And one of your comments in particular caught my attention. Love the pod, says James Foxall. Patrick Tombay just nearly had me in tears. What a hero. But well, I couldn't agree more, James. And hello there. Long time no speak. Hope you're well. And please, everybody, keep your feedback coming. We really love it. And remember to use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. And you can tweet me at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Until next time, keep it flat out.